Um, all right, I will try to, it is going to be a bit less entertaining, but um, I will try to follow up to this presentation. Uh, I will introduce my doctoral and postdoctoral research. I will try to be as brief as possible on that part to then move on to some more general points which uh, have been addressed a few times yesterday and today. So I'm just kind of adding my perspective to that and hopefully we it can follow um, in the discussions as well. Uh, and also many thanks to Itai Pai and to Amiens for having this seminar because all the discussions that we've had both in this room and outside of this room in the last couple of days have been very stimulating, so that's great. Um, so yeah, just as an introduction, uh, this is a quick overview of uh, what I do. Um, so I gr graduated from Reading in 2007. Um, I have been working as a type designer since um, and uh, have been doing it as an independent type designer for the last 10 years. Um, I started my PhD in type history in Reading in 2010, uh, which was awarded four years later, and I have been uh, involved in a few research projects uh, since that time. Uh, and I have, uh, I have also been um, teaching in various type design courses uh, for the last seven years. So I taught in Amiens for a few years. Um, I have been teaching in Nancy for, at the INRT for the last seven years, um, and I'm, I'm just starting a new um, uh, teaching job in ECAL in Lausanne. Um, which means that um, I spend my working time navigating between these three activities that have been coming uh, back uh, in, the, in, in the last two days. And, and uh, Titus described very accurately kind of the, the challenges of, of um, navigating between the three of them. Uh, but uh, for me, these three aspects of my work are very much uh, connected. Uh, they feed into each other. They, uh, each activity gets uh, richer from the other two. And I couldn't really imagine uh, not doing all three, uh, at least now, not trying to do all three. Um, and yeah, the real challenge is usually to find the right balance. Uh, what I have found for me, uh, what seems to work is that I don't try to do all of them in an equal capacity at the same time, but there are phases when I will more focus on the design and then uh, on the research and then on the teaching and then from one year to another, from uh, you know, a semester to another, the emphasis will tend to vary. Uh, at least I feel very fortunate to be able to do um, all three so far. Um, I initially trained as a practitioner. Uh, I started my professional life as a designer. I had a very practical training and I had absolutely no intention of pursuing an academic career. Nobody in my family had ever done a PhD. So I think I was just very naive about it when I embarked on it. Um, and I still do not see myself as a historian. Um, so I, I studied at Ecole Estienne and then the MA in Reading obviously gave me some um, solid uh, grounding, so solid foundation in type history. Um, and, uh, but I was mostly interested in di designing type. Uh, once I started working as a type designer, however, mm -hmm. The job and raised a number of questions specifically related to 20th century type history and, and in particular my job at Monotype. And I started to have a number of questions about the consequences of uh, technological changes on the, on the development of typeface design and the way we design typefaces today. Um, so in 2010, um, the, an opportunity arose uh, at Reading to undertake a PhD on a topic that was very much related to these interrogations. Um, it was an opportunity to undertake what is called, I think they still exist, they're called Collaborative Doctoral Awards, which is a funding scheme from the Arts and Humanities Research Council in the UK. Um, the, the basis for that funding is to have a partnership between an academic institution, so in this case, Reading, and some non-academic um, entities. Um, so for this project, it was with the Musée de l'Imprimerie, the printing museum in Lyon, uh, and to some extent as well, the, the, uh, the monotype company and, and the, 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 the archives more specifically. So that means that the project was kind of put together by uh, Paul Luna from Reading and Alan Marshall, the head of the museum, who uh, were my supervisors with Fiona Ross. Um, they applied for funding, they got it, and then they looked for someone to do the research, um, which is how I came to consider the possibility of doing a PhD, and which also meant that I didn't have to look for funding, um, but the other side of that was that I wasn't choosing my subject, but um, I was fortunate that this was very much answering <coughs> some of the questions I had anyway. 
So the research involved um, delving into the archives of these three institutions to work on a very specific time period, which was the photo time setting era, so the 1950s to the 1970s. And I'm not going to speak very much about the research. The idea basically was to provide a kind of critical study of that period uh, during which photogra photographic processes took over from metal type. Um, and I, I was not so much interested in the technologies themselves, but I was more interested in their in influence on typeface design. So some of the questions I addressed were uh, which typefaces were um, adapted from uh, metal to phototype setting, how were they adapted, why, um, were there new designs at that period and how did they emerge and how did, maybe more, more broadly, how did the change in technology affect the practice of type designers and uh, how did it affect type manufacturers. So the project essentially relied on archival research and interviews and drawings and type specimens. Um, so that was, to, so to say, that was fairly standard historical research and we've heard quite a lot about this uh, the last couple of days. And the output was uh, essentially revolved around uh, writing this thesis, which I have not published. Um, I did uh, um, tr translate a couple of articles into French, which were published in, in books. Um, and I do send the thesis to anyone who sends me a nice email for, to ask for it. Um, and part of the, of the scheme of the Collaborative Doctoral Award um, involved building what is called, and we heard about it yesterday, transferable skills. Um, so in my case, and that was one of the uh, appealing reasons for undertaking the PhD, um, uh, I had the opportunity to collaborate with the Printing Museum in Lyon to be trained in handling archival material and also in setting up exhibitions. Um, so that, for me, that was a big incentive for doing the research because I could see something very uh, concrete, very tangible about the project and, and um, yeah, that was somehow reassuring for me. Um, I also had the opportunity to organize a symposium at the museum and to present uh, an exhibition uh, related to my PhD research. And that collaboration with the museum was actually very fruitful because I, I still work with them uh, on a regular basis and I moved to Lyon since. So um, I was awarded the PhD in 2014. Um, by then, I started uh, teaching in Amiens and in Nancy. Um, and as I said, the work with the museum, all this um, kind of motiv motivated me to move back to France. Um, my involvement with the archives in Reading, in Lyon and at Monotype uh, paved the way to two subsequent uh, research projects. The first one involved uh, researching the, the, the work of type designer uh, Ladislas Mandel, whose archives are held at the Printing Museum in Lyon. I had become uh, familiar with Mandel's archives during my PhD. Um, he, um, Ladislas Mandel had worked with uh, Adrian Frutiger at De Bernier and Peignot in the 1950s and the 1960s. He was very much involved in the production of typefaces for phototype setting. Um, his archives had formed an important part of my research and I knew that Mandel was an influential figure of, of French type history and, and the, the education of type in France but very little had been known to assess his contribution and his work. And during the PhD, Titus, Sebastian and me did our PhD at the same time in Reading. And uh, Sebastian and I had a lot of discussions about Mandel and about um, his influence on, on French, um, uh, the French type scene. Um, and so once we were both finished with our PhD, we thought it might be interesting to do a research project around his archives. So this was the, the, the name of the project. Um, and uh, we, uh, we undertook it here in Amiens with uh, partial funding from the French Ministry of Culture. And a, a student from the post-diplôme here, Dorin Sauzet, joined us on the project um, and yes, worked with us on the research. Part of our work, uh, uh, of our work involved uh, cataloging a lot of models archives and figuring out their content. We then decided to focus our research on uh, one kind of specific aspect of his work, which was the design of typefaces for telephone directories. Um, so here again, I'm not going to go into details because you've heard a lot of things the last couple of days. Um, and there are um, videos online of the talks we have done on the subject at ATIPI and here. Um, all I will say is that the, 
the output, the, the main output of this research has been two articles that we published in the Swiss magazine Footnote. So the first article uh, uh, focused on one typeface called Galfra, and the second one on a th series of three typefaces called Nordica, Lusitania, and Lineal. Um, and as I said, initially we received funding from the French Ministry uh, they ha of Culture. They had initially committed to um, uh, fund the project for two years. H however, after one year, they decided to cut the funding. Um, we, we were not really given a, an explanation. There, was, there wasn't really a way of appealing to the decision. Um, luckily, Barbara found ways of uh, uh, like, yeah, subsidizing the projects that we were able to work on it for a further year and to publish these two articles, but after that we decided that um, we would stop the project. And the second research project, which I am still currently working on, is uh, entitled Women in Type. Um, it partly involves researching the archives of the uh, Monotype Drawing Office and the archives of the Linotype Department of, uh, for the Linotype Department for Typographic Development, uh, and these are part of the non-Latin collections in Reading. Um, and again, this is something that stemmed to in some ways from my uh, PhD research because while researching the phototype setting period, I discovered the role that had been played by type that drawing offices in, um, uh, or sometimes they were called design studios and they were integrated in uh, type foundries and type, type manufacturing uh, companies. Uh, this, for instance, is the monotype drawing office in the 1950s. And I, I became really interested in the history of these departments uh, because uh, they, when you start looking into it, you see that they contributed quite a lot to 20th century uh, type making, but they received very little credit for their work. And I was struck that by the fact that um, typefaces were historically always attributed to one designer, um, while in the background you had people with all kinds of skills and experience who contributed to making things happen, um, as you see on, on these pictures, including some women. And this, inter this interest uh, converged with uh, Fiona, uh, Fiona's experience, both as a practitioner and as a researcher. Um, as I said, Fiona had been my PhD supervisor, and uh, prior to her academic career, she managed the Department of Typographic Development at Linotype, and that department included the Type Drawing Office. And actually, the project started with the idea is that we would try to um, interview all the women on that picture. So this led us to put together this project called Women in Type, a social history of women's roles in type drawing offices. Um, there are three of us in the team. There is also uh, Helena Lecker who works with us. And uh, this project is funded by the Leverhulme Trust. I will say a bit more about that uh, in a minute. Um, it's hosted by the University of Reading. And the aim is to provide a kind of a socio-historical account of women's role in type drawing studios, uh, and we focus most specif specifically on monotype and linotype. Um, again, I will not go into details about the project. Uh, there are talks online. I can tell you all about it somehow when we have coffee, if you want. Um, uh, yeah, so I, I think you don't need all of that. Uh, yeah, one thing I wanted to say is that you know, we're, we are studying like the more like socio-historical aspects of their work, like who were they, how were they hired, there is also all the technological background, um, and one thing that's really important to us is the question of the contribution to design. Um, we're not trying to argue that what these women did was uh, d design or that they were type designers, but we do argue that they contributed something to the making of these typefaces. And that was to various degrees, depending on the period uh, during which they were working, the typefaces, um, uh, depending on the company. But I think to me and to all three of us, this issue of the contribution to design is very important. And it's something that I've been increasingly reading about. Um, of, because working on... on this project, of course, has involved reading a lot about women's history and reading a lot about feminist uh, history as well, and um, about how, as historians, we have a responsibility because the work what, that we do, um, and someone mentioned it, I can't remember if it was Caroline earlier today, but that you know, we, we, she said about the fact that history is moving and, and we are looking at things at a specific angle and that kind of changed the way history is written and, and read. Um, and I just thought I would, 
um, quote Cheryl Buckley. It's a text that she wrote 35 years ago. It's a bit long, uh, this uh, quote, but um, I think to me it's quite important. She says, the centrality of the designer as the person who determines meaning in design is undermined by the complex nature of design development, production and consumption, a process involving numerous people Design then is a coll collective process. Its meaning can only be determined by an examination of the interaction of individuals, groups, and organizations within specific societal structures. And she says, uh, which is quite important to me as well, that the monograph, so the primary method used by historians to focus on the designer, is an inadequate vehicle for exploring the complexity of design production and conception. And when I see 35 years, 35 years after she wrote this, how we look at design history and how, for example, most exhibitions are curated, uh, we still have very much that focus on the designer. And uh, to me, it's important that we try to look at it differently. So uh, yeah, Woman in Type is due to run for another year. <coughs> Sorry, we have uh, set up a blog on which we post some very, very irregular, irregular updates on the work. Um, we have also been working on a number of things that we'll uh, discuss in a minute. So that's just for kind of the past and current research interests. And these are a few points that I will um, discuss briefly. And again, this, these things have been discussed the last couple of days already. So the first one is um, the relationship between practice and research. Um, personally, I have embarked on, on historical research uh, as a practitioner because I was uh, interested and keen to contribute to the history of uh, my discipline. And to me, it is essential that the findings from these research projects uh, not only benefit my practice, but also the practice of fellow uh, designers. My own approach has been essentially a historical one. So as you see, all the projects I've been involved uh, with basically have to do with uh, archive research or interviewing people. And um, this is what you could call uh, research into typeface design. It is an essential step, step in building a critical understanding of our field and in uh, strengthening it. But um, as we have seen since yesterday, there, there can be also another approach to research, which um, I have called here research through type, typography and typeface design. So um, I think uh, Patrick yesterday gave an excellent example of that and Sarah this morning as well. Um, and this is an approach that we have been actively developing at uh, ANRT in Nancy. Uh, as I said, I've been teaching there for the last seven years. And uh, this way of approaching research through typeface design and typography has been very much at the heart as what uh, Thomas Marchand, the director of ANRT, um, has been uh, willing to implement and, and the way research is going in that institutions. And the argument is to say that um, typeface design can be a tool that uh, is used by many uh, researchers in many other disciplines and the question is how do we build um, partnerships with these uh, other areas so that we can uh, work together on research projects. Um, so yeah, Sarah mentioned, discussed her work this morning and she talked about a number of other projects that we're doing so I'm not going to spend too much time on that. There is the missing script project that's happening between the INRT, the University of Berkeley in the USA and uh, Hochschule Mainz in Germany uh, where the, the aim of that project is to basically develop um, sustainable typographic forms for minority, sc minority scripts that have either not yet been encoded in Unicode or ju have just been encoded but do not have a kind of a first typographical form and I'm not saying a perfect form but just at least a first step towards a typographical form. Um, my Morgan, uh, who is here uh, today, gave a talk about this at the Science Everything conference and the talk is online. Uh, there, I wanted to mention also Pierre Fournier's research because Pierre is here. Uh, Pierre has been working with Egypt, um, Egyptologists about this font, um, uh, hierog hieroglyphic font, um, and he's now undertaken a PhD um, on the project um, and uh, on a very different aspect. Um, of, of research in typography. There is also yeah, Elo Eloisa Perez research who is also doing <coughs> her PhD in partnership between Sorbonne uh, and uh, the laboratories called CELSA and the ANRT. And what um, Eloisa does is that she develops prototypes that she calls pre which you can see here at the bottom uh, right. 
And these prelates are being uh, tested with very young children as a way to int introduce them to writing. Um, and Eloisa will defend her thesis sometime this year. Um, I think the, the model uh, put in place at ANRT is very promising um, because it kind of enables a prospect of, a, you know, we have been discussing the kind of struggle of articulating a design practice and a research practice, and these kind of projects offer a better articulation between the two, uh, although it does require from the researcher to, require, to acquire some kind of expertise in another area. Um, I would say also that if we reflect on how we, we have been carrying out that research over the last seven years, we still face a number of issues. Um, the first one being that art schools, uh, such as here in Amiens or INRT, um, are not part of the un of universities, which means that PhDs have to be carry out, carried out in, in uh, partnership with the universities, and um, a supervisor has to be uh, picked or, or found f um, who will have a special kind of, uh, in French we call it habilitation, uh, à diriger des recherches. In German I know it's called habilitation, which uh, the, in the Anglo-Saxon system you don't have to have that. Uh, but that means that we can't supervise our own research in an autonomous way uh, in Nancy, for instance. And um, this kind of uh, partnership make very much sense um, in the project that we do at ANRT because the research itself is very much interdisciplinary. Um, and when the partner university clearly sees the benefits of the research, the results can be very convincing and very rewarding. And I think Sarah's research is an, a very good example of that. But in some cases, um, we see also that once the student embarks on the, on, the, on the doctoral research, the partner university might consider that the design component of the research is a bonus, um, and they might advocate a more historical or theoretical approach. And that's where we feel that we need more legitimacy and more aut autonomy to be able to kind of um, affirm the, the, role or the role of the design practice as, a, as a, an integral component of the research. There is also the question of uh, how is this research evaluated and by whom? And obviously there is the issue of funding because when a design student undertakes research in a different department, um, often there isn't clearly a, an identified path for funding and we see that we usually have to find funding on an ad hoc basis depending on the project. So yeah, that's, that was the, the issue of funding and I, I thought I would also share my um, perspective of looking for funding from, for my own research. Uh, I mentioned already what happened with the French Ministry of Culture when we did the research here in Amiens on, on Mandel. Um, I was lucky that both my PhD, my MA and my PhD were funded by the Arts and Humanities Research Council in the UK. Uh, this is a public body, a national funding agency and um, I said for the Women in Type Research Project, we applied to the Leverhulm Trust, which is a charity and a very large national grant-making organization in the UK. And I would say that from a French perspective, these kind of bodies um, like HRC and Leverhulm are quite wonderful uh, because they, they provide uh, very good um, opportunities to fund research. The, the application process is very clear. Uh, research in typography is, uh, is fully eligible for funding. And if you do get a grant awarded, um, it provides, uh, I think, pretty good conditions for carrying out your research. But as um, Titus mentioned, these grants are very competitive uh, and they involve a lengthy and tedious process of application. For women in type, for instance, um, we were told that we had a 17% chance of getting a project research grant. Um, there is a person at the university who helps you through the process of application. For us, the process took almost two years uh, it involved applying for funds first internally within the university to run a pilot study, uh, and then there were two former rounds, uh, two further rounds of application for the, within the Liverhulm Trust. It also involved uh, providing very precise costings for the project. Every single uh, train ride, uh, every single photocopy, we had to predict everything in advance. Um, then obviously you just get a. Uh, you know, grant money, like a, a lump sum of money, but you have to prove that you've spent the money in the way that you said you would spend it, which is quite, yeah, quite heavy process. 
also in those two years of applying for the grant, I have moved back to France, I had a baby, all these things kind of affect the whole process and the conditions in which you will carry out the research. Um, there is also, uh, because I had moved back to France, what happened then is that the university couldn't give me a contract. I, 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 I'm a subcontractor to the university, which is kind of a funny position to be in. The good side of that is that I, I'm, I don't have to put up with all the admin that I see my colleagues are having to deal with, you know, everything to do with ref, with impact, with all these things are, are, I don't have to worry about. I can just focus on the research, which is a luxury in my view. Yeah, I mentioned what happened with the, with the um, Ministry of Culture here. Um, I think Sebastian and Thomas would be much more qualified than I am to talk about how funding happens in France for research, but because art, art schools are not part of the university, it means the, yeah, the funding process is, is quite unclear. There is also an ambiguity in the fact that this is higher education and this is research, but these institutions depend from the Ministry of Culture. So, and not, uh, so we kind of partly depend from the uh, Ministère de l'Enseignement Supérieur et de la, et de, et de la Recherche, but yeah, it's, um, it's a tricky situation. Um, that also brings us to the issue of status. Um, I think we're going to be discussing it afterwards. My main issue with status is how can I combine design, research, and te teaching activities? This is how things turned out for me so far. Um, I'm an artist auteur, so I'm registered as an artist auteur in France, uh, self-employed. Um, I am a postdoctoral researcher on a three-year contract part-time in Reading. And I teach on a contract that are short-term renewable part-time teaching contracts in various art schools. Um, I have been working for 12 years now. I love my job. I feel um, very fortunate to do what I'm doing. Um, and I want to keep doing these activities in parallel. Um, I do really enjoy them. I just thought I would report two anecdotes that happened to me recently are kind of a reality check on this kind of how this situation might look from the outside. The first one is from Lambert Creton, my bank advisor. Um, I met him a few months ago because we wanted to buy a flat. And <laughs> he looked at my file and he, he honestly, he, he said, look, you, you have four jobs, none of which is permanent. Is, is that right? And I was like, I suppose so. And he, he generally felt kind of sorry for me as if I was, it was, I was really having a hard time with that, which I didn't feel I had. But yeah, looking from the outside probably looks like it. And the other um, quote is from my accountant just last month. I was trying to sort out my accounting. I emailed her a few questions about my situation, to which she responded, your case is very specific. I cannot help you. And I do not know of any other accountant who will be able to help. Now, I didn't, I don't think my situation is that complicated, but it's just this thing of, you know, either you're in an independent uh, um, entrepreneur or, you know, independent designer, or you have these kind of long-term, short-term contracts, but working across countries, um, across uh, different, yeah, all these things are, seem to be a bit too much to handle for the French system. Um, so all I can say for now is that I just wish for some kind of simpler, more stable status that would enable me to combine all three activities. Um, and there is, um, there is a kind of a, you saw yesterday the protest in front of the school. People are, are in France are, are um, uh, fighting for their pensions. Uh, there is also uh, some kind of reformation of the system coming up for the higher education system and for research. And this is one of the uh, images that uh, circulate at the moment on the social networks and it says, the precarious researcher is afraid of losing his job. Uh, he takes no risk, uh, he doesn't invent, and he spends half of his time, uh, of his work time, looking for his next contract. Um, and that's what we, we don't want that to happen, and I think to some extent it's already happening, um, and it's good to try to think of ways of doing things differently. Uh, ideally, it would be great also to have a status that enables us to have collaborations. Um, type design is a rather niche activity. Um, there are very few adequate institutions uh, in the world that host research in typography as it stands. And um, I think this meeting today is a testament to the idea that collaboration is essential to making uh, significant contributions to um, our field. 
So collaboration across institutions, across countries, and across disciplines, that has already been mentioned as well by, uh, by Ratna earlier. And uh, my last point will be the question of output. Um, again, uh, it has been mentioned this morning. Um, as Ratna said, uh, all this wonderful research only makes sense if it's shared, uh, not only with fellow type designers and researchers, but also to, with the wider audience. So it raises the issue of how we share this research, uh, where and what can we or should we publish. Um, for most funding bodies and academic institutions, the, the standard for evaluating the value of research is um, academic publication. I have recently been faced with the issue of submitting a paper to an academic journal. And um, for me, the most frustrating aspect of the process was the very limited number of images that I was allowed to have alongside my text. Um, to me, it doesn't reflect the way we carry out our research and uh, it doesn't reflect the relevance of our findings, um, which are sometimes necessarily very visual and cannot be expressed exclusively with words. So typography papers used to be a very good uh, answer to that. Unfortunately, it um, doesn't seem to exist anymore. There are some interesting progress. For example, design issues published by the MIT press um, invite submission for what they call visual projects, and they say, uh, visual product of a theoretical or experimental nature and the criteria for selection is that the work be provocative and of high visual quality. I'm not quite sure what that means, but uh, that's at least some progress. Um, also, I know very few uh, practitioners who buy academic journals. I, I, yeah, personally, I didn't used to. Um, so I feel that the main reason for publishing in these kind of journals is to get some kind of validation from my peers um, academically, uh, but I'm not sure this is the most efficient way of sharing the research with the wider community. So for that, I think we all pre prefer all other kind of non-academic publications, for instance. Uh, talks, of course, which um, is a great way of sharing with our, our, our peers. Um, many departments and schools, including here in Amiens and I, I at ANRT uh, proposed these thematic one-day symposiums, which are excellent opportunities to share research findings and encourage uh, exchange of knowledge and ideas. Exhibitions as well, I think, are both effective and very pedagogical uh, means of presenting certain types of research. And as part of uh, Women in Type, we have also been trying to think of other ways of outputting our findings. So we've been working on this uh, interactive timeline, which raises a lot of questions to uh, copyright of images, for instance. Um, but we're also working on, on, we don't really know how to call it for now, some kind of digital display, some kind of website, which would enable visitors to navigate through our research in a more visual way, at least as a way of entering um, the research, even though you know, the idea is to have something that is very thorough and up to academic standards, but just to try to think of yeah, ways that might be more appropriate for our kind of approach um, to research. Um, and this is still work in progress. That's where we are. Thank you. So thank you very much. First of all, um, I enjoyed both of your presentations, and I don't think I've ever been more seen at a typography conference than in Titus's uh, first half of the talk. So uh, I, I have generally good feelings. Um, but uh, sort of the solution in both of your uh, talks was getting research, paid research uh, things happening at the University of Reading. Uh, and Jerry said earlier today that uh, success uh, would be that if we had this conference again in 10 years in the University of Reading, as I mentioned, uh, and I don't see a path to that happening. Maybe Rich is thinking uh, about right. <laughs> 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 uh, that. Well, I'm pointing at you. Would, would you want to say some of the stuff that you've done? <laughs> because uh, maybe the big, the big sort of state level or nearly state level institutional funding bodies are not the only options. Because there, you've been quite successful in more region. Let's say, yeah. Um, it's a bit tricky. Like um, after completing. Uh, your studies, like whether it's MA going on to a PhD <laughs> research, um, and and then afterwards graduating from both of them, like to actually in a sense keep up, 
because you do have some expectations from not only yourself but also from people around you to, to keep up with the studies and the research and what you're doing. Um, in my case, it's a bit, um, I'm not saying that it's totally different than yours because I see similarities that are happening as well. Um, but I also moved back, for instance, uh, to Belgium after the PhD. I also was interested in uh, related subjects that I was willing to do study and research more into. And they also came out from uh, the MA also in Reading, the PhD in Reading and afterwards. Um, so then after my PhD, I also applied for a Leverium Trust uh, project, uh, postdoctoral, uh, to do some studies on Mongolian, uh, for instance. Um, moving back to Belgium, um, I, 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 in a sense, was teaching already in one art school, um, which was like also not really like a steady position because it was not a fixed contract, but also like annual renewable. Um, and I became independent. I, funded, I, I founded my own studio, um, also to actually be busy in a sense because I'm totally in independent. I don't depend on a school to be like supporting me full time. Um, I don't work for a, a, a foundry or like um, a big company, so I try to sustain myself uh, in that sense. But I try to, in a sense, try to find other means to actually contribute to the community and also to share my experience, my research and my knowledge to also a broader audience, not just type designers or designers, but also like a newer generation to try to actually get them interested in uh, also undertaking studies or research in a different way. And one of the projects that I'm going to talk about uh, next week actually is actually finding ways to also find funding for multidisciplinary projects in different um, categories. I don't know if I explain it well enough, but it's also to do all with type design research, printing history research. Um, and in the school that I'm teaching now, we also try, have to find, try to find means or ways to be self-sustainable so that the department can be self-funding in a sense. So we have to try to come up as a, a teacher also to come up with practice-based um, projects. So the project that I will be embarking on now, for instance, uh, is called Typo Belgique. Um, and it's actually based on, on uh, some untold history of Belgian uh, printing of history. And um, what we will aim to do is also together with someone who, like Alice, uh, is, uh, like has had helped uh, with putting the funding together, like the, the proposal together, is to come up with like a bigger project so that uh, the research of not just the history being told, um, but also like, for instance, um, select a few typefaces of some of the foundries um, which have disappeared uh, to uh, be uh, the selection of typefaces from those foundries, which will be um, um, not revived, but interpreted for new digital fonts. Um, and then actually the part of seeking funding uh, for this project is to finding partnerships with um, the actual industry and, and everyday life. So we are seeking collaborations with publishing houses, with newspapers, with the design community, with uh, students who are actually now at the um, bachelor and master program, but also alumni to actually help with the digitization. Um, and um, also like these external partners um, to actually fund part of the, um, the project so that the funds can be used um, in publications that they will actually publish in Belgium. So to actually bring back that kind of uh, cultural or visual history back into everyday life today. Um, also with artists and um, authors and, uh, for instance, poets. So that's, that's outputs, which is not only like, of course, also an exhibition and like some sort of, of publication, but also in put into practice uh, so that they can make installations or have them poets um, being um, installed in, um, how should I say, the public space, uh, so that in every major we have still to decide which cities in Belgium it is, is actually that in each major city in Belgium there will be some representation of this, of this project. 
Um, and I think in that sense, it's also to involve other people into your own research so that it's not just you undertaking it, but so that the um, partners actually, during the research that you're doing, collaborate with you and have an output at the same time. And in that sense, it's, it's difficult, I have to say as well, to actually manage everything because like Dan, like Titus, like Alice and like others who we've seen and heard here like uh, today and yesterday as well, it's indeed trying to find a balance between the tree and your everyday life. And I think the best thing you can have is passion for what you're doing because then in a sense, um, the boundaries sometimes blur and you just continue with what you're doing. Um, but yeah, I don't know. I think it's opening it up to other communities and trying to have them also integrate them themselves into your own project that might be helpful. And then that it's not just, I've, I always find it scary that, and I've, I've, I've found it like throughout the whole academic career I had so far, like what you're doing uh, that it's just relevant for yourself. You can get um, have nice feedback from other people, other com um, uh, communities who or cultures who read the research, see the research. Oh, it's great you're doing it, and it's a privilege that you had access to this. Yes, but it's I find it also necessary to share it, and in a sense that it's nice to have like an output, like a, an article or a book, but that they can actually use your research and do something with it and. I think that's maybe a new path to follow, um, also to seek those kind of funding in places where you don't expect it, it mm. and maybe try to find some more, I don't know if it's innovative, but just try to find um, research in places that you might not expect in the, in the first place and trying to seek other opportunities um, and that it's not just an isolated project anymore because it can be very lonely. I mean, mm -hmm. I do have a partner as well and not, no children uh, at the moment. But in a sense, it's like you can end up doing the research just by yourself in your room, even though that you're visiting places and meeting lovely people and everything. Um, but I think if you can put it in such a level that you integrate the industry, um, whether it's commercial or not, that's something I leave into th in the middle because yeah, that's another thing that you can follow as well. But I think like just having like, in the case of the project that I will embark on now, just having my local belt, my local national community in Belgium, being inviting them to be part of it so that it's it's a communal thing, I think might be something that's uh, interesting as well. So that it's not just like an isolated or sturdy thing. Okay, that's a new project you're doing, fine for you after two, three years, that's what it was. And then, yeah, the output is there, but then I think if you engage others to be part of it, maybe that can be another yeah. output. I don't know if that's what you wanted, Jerry, to, for me to explain in a sense. Yeah. Um, but it's, yeah, <laughs> like. Well, I'll just play, because I think you touched on a lot of interesting issues, because we've been talking about conventional research, the stuff that uh, will be funded if it adds to your citation indexes and so on. But uh, a big part of this could be happening that we are in an applied discipline and the relationship with industry or uh, the discussion of the project in a manner that people outside the specific field can understand it and see its value is quite important. In Titus's case, there's all discussion of, well, what will be uh, the outcome from your research in a manner that influences practitioners. Uh, and maybe we need to be less defensive about this, less insecure about the kind of research and be quite bullish in saying, well, our research does have an impact, does have a relationship, and it might be cultural, social, it might have to do with identity, it might have to do with just people doing some things differently or better. Uh, it's also useful to keep in mind that we operate extremely fortunately in a European environment where there is some money that goes into this. Horizon 2020 gives more money now into design, design, not typography. Uh, but the people who read these things are getting better at understanding what type and typography are. Uh, we're not where we were 20 years ago in a, being a completely obscure niche discipline. But people have a better understanding of what we are. Uh, so I think despite some cause for pessimism, the moment is good there is possibilities to put together these kind of opportunities and projects 
much more proactively than we do and in a way that will enable uh, a much deeper integration of what could be called research and practice and then some relation with community. Yeah, and, uh, just to add to this, because I, I don't, my answer to Dan's question is no, when you're saying, don't you think there's no chance that things are going to move forward and that, you know, we're not going to all get stuck about Reading. Um, I'm very grateful to uh, in everything that Reading has to offer, but you should look, I think Yo is a good example, Ricardo, Titus, me, we all moved from England. Um, I can only speak for myself, but I, you know, why am I back in France? Why do I teach in France? I think I have a very good work-life balance. I think the prospects for research are actually quite exciting. I know that funding is a big issue, but the way, uh, you know, the questions that are being asked in Amiens, the questions that are being asked in, asked in Nancy, um, are, I find them very exciting. And, and you know, in, in England, there is, uh, we, there is a very well-established way of, of applying for funding, which means that at the moment, it's easier for us to, you, to get into these tracks. And, and there are so many people in the department that have so much experience to offer. But I think as young researchers and teachers and type designers, um, I feel that um, this is an exciting time to be in France and it's an exciting time to be contributing to the discussion as to how we are doing research and try to imagine other ways of, of doing it which are maybe less historical for instance um, and yeah I don't know how the others feel about you know the ones who moved away from from Britain but um, it is a good time. Um, <laughs> I just want to follow up on what Alyssa is saying, um, also in response to uh, the controversial thought that Dan had. Um, and just thinking about what Caroline was saying earlier and what Rathna was pointing about earlier about what is typography. I think that if time and time again you find yourself at a conference where you look around and you only see people that you know from Reading, which can be lovely. I love going to conferences and seeing my friends and seeing uh, fellow alumni like Titus and Alice who are now further ahead than where I am and hearing about their success and having something to aspire to is great, but also if you find that that happens again and again, maybe you need to rethink what you think is typography and the events that you choose to go to because typography can be so much wider than just type design and type design specific conferences. Um, the work that uh, Vaibhav Singh is now doing, he's put together I think now three, four conferences where he has looked into a lot of type adjacent and sort of visual material, sort of print culture conferences that draw together people from a lot of different disciplinaries that really do feed into our work. So I think there's a lot of events, conferences, talks that you can go to where they will definitely add something to your work and broaden your perspectives. and. It's great if we can manage to bring people from those disciplines into conferences like A-Type-I, but I don't think that's a fault with A-Type-I. This sort of specialization happens. People have only so, many so much time to put into making talks for conferences, which can take a lot of time, to be honest. So I think it's, again, that question of what is typography, and maybe if we can broaden our views personally, then we will find ourselves putting ourselves in position to maybe not see so many people from Reading and, you know, people from universities like SOAS, people from different parts of the world that can teach us so much about our own field that we didn't even know we needed to know. Well, and maybe there are, there are pockets of people everywhere in the world, quite literally, that are interested and engaging in the subject. Um, it's not a coincidence that the first two working seminars were not in Europe and we're not in Reading today. Um, there's a lot of stuff happening in India, as far as I know. There's a lot of stuff happening in the Gulf. Um, I think in Iran there's a very active and very eager community. Um, who knows, nobody expected the Berlin Wall to fall and maybe things will improve for Iran soon. And we can engage. In a, in internationally a bit more. So I think, yeah, there are very tangible um, <coughs> reasons to be optimistic. And I think the field has moved on incredibly in the last 15 years. Uh, I guess we also need to have a little bit of patience for things to <laughs> mushroom elsewhere. I think the, the spores, the seeds have been planted, but well, they still need to grow a bit more.
mountains. <laughs> I'm sorry that this is being recorded, but I think as long as the requirement for speaking at ATI Pi is the presentation in English language, you are going to leave out a lot of people and a lot of people who may want to participate. I'll counter you on that because the second working seminar was in Spanish because it was... In Tokyo. Sorry? Uh, yeah, so the working seminar was in Spanish because the local community is in Spanish and that was intentional. And we had the strand in Japanese in Tokyo to support the Japanese community. Incredible effort going into running actually a really cumbersome event with languages that we can't very readily translate. So I think we're doing what we can, uh, whatever that is possible to do. Uh, what we'd want is maybe the Iranian uh, design community. They are getting, sanctioned. Hmm? They are sanctioned. My email works. <laughs> uh, if I can get emails from Kuwait and the UAE and so on, or find the one app that still works through, which I use, this one app I use only with the UAE people and so on. Uh, maybe the Iranians get, get in touch and we can help them put on their own working seminar there. Uh, so I will be a little bit um, I mean, Iran defensive is about... Case. Yeah, I get the whole English thing. It's not my native language, no, so I have no guilt about this. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but uh, there is also merit in learning how to operate in an international world. Because uh, Ricardo has uh, often talked about the problem of the huge scholarship that was only in Italian, uh, and actually people don't know necessarily about it, and it's neither the fault of Italian scholars or of the others who don't have time to learn Italian. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but actually, if you're operating in a global scholarship environment, you do have a need of some means of linking up with each other. I will never learn Italian or Hebrew or Dutch, uh, so I need some way to have access to these things, even and, if it's just an abstract. From the perspective from here, I can say that I see one single native English speaker. So I think that, that speaks volumes. <laughs> uh, yes, it does not English. <laughs> um, teachers and Alice, thank you very much. Um, there's a really kind of serious baseline, though, to the things that you were saying with great enthusiasm. And I just wonder about your reflections and your advice for people, because there's, there is precarity, isn't there? And I think that you, you spoke about that. You, you cannot make a career in, in research. You are, you are in practice, you know, you're type designers. Um, there's kind of a background that's feeding that. And then on top of that is a, is a little layer, and then on top of that is, a, is another layer. Um, and it's a similar situation, I'd say, that yes, in the UK you have tremendous amount of opportunities for funding, but as, as you've also reflected in, in your talks, uh, an academics contract is about various things. It's about teaching, it's about marketing, it's about assessment, it's about admin, it's about funding, it's about, I'm losing my breath as I talk about what, you know. Um, so it, in terms of a support system, in order to encourage that research, I can't find, I can't say that there is any country that kind of, you know, I think that academics across the world in our subject at least face that. What's your advice to encourage people to engage in research based on your own experiences? What would you say to emerging researchers to encourage them to, to kind of undertake the paths that you've, that you've taken? Um, I don't think I'm a good person to give advice because, as I said, I don't have a plan at all. So I didn't plan on doing the PhD. I didn't plan on doing further research, and the things just happen. I, I guess the what what the best advice is to have a. I mean, there is a, a network of wonderful people who are interested in similar things as us, and when you see an opportunity, just be enthusiastic about it and go for it. And and you know, Titus said you have to be a jack of all trades, and I think that's that's part of. Yeah, part of the key to that, but I really wouldn't know. I don't know what I'll be doing next once, you know, Woman in Type is running for another year. I have no clue whether I'll do further research after that. I'm, I know that, uh, you know, I'm very happy of uh, following research project at, at ANRT and I want to carry on doing that because it's very exciting. Um, but th there is, I, I can't see any sort of career plan in that. And I think I'm def I'm deliberately not pursuing an academic career because as I said I, all the admin uh, all the things that might go with it 
really don't interest me and I would rather design type to you know to fund the the research that I might be doing on the side so yeah it probably doesn't sound very very much like a plan yeah I would second that uh, I had yeah I don't know I don't think that I'll be in academia in three years time um, and I hadn't planned to do that and I was very genuine when I said that I feel to be very lucky to have multiple interests and multiple op options of stuff to do and I'm, I'm, I would have been very happy to just pursue my practical commercial work um, had I not received that scholarship. Um, so yeah, I, I kind of embrace the situation and make the best of it. Um, maybe that's a very luxurious position to be in and yes, that's how I feel about it and so that's, yeah, that's how I play. <laughs> I'm getting the signal that this is a good time to stop. So I'm going to say thank you very much again. Thank you. Uh,